en el Departamento de Matemáticas de ITAN. Ella estudió su licenciatura, maestría y doctorado en la Universidad de Nicolás Copérnico en Toru, Colonia. Así que pues la vamos a escuchar. Gracias. So, let's start. It's very nice to meet you. Thank you for your invitation. And uh, so the aim of my work today is to formulate sufficient and necessary conditions for the existence of bifurcations of central configurations in the n body problem. And I try to explain a little bit about this subject. So the plan is the following. So first we start with the definition of central configuration of the embodied problem. Then we I give you some abstract results, and at the end we uh, present some applications to celestial mechanics. So one of the most fundamental problems in celestial mechanics is to determine the motion path for n bodies uh, with the assumption that these bodies interact among themselves through no other forces than the gravitational mutual attraction according to Newton's gravitational laws. So let's consider n particles or n bodies uh, and they are moving in the d-dimensional equilibrium space. So for d equals 2 we think about particles moving on the plane. Uh, this is the planar body problem and for d equals 3 uh, we consider spatial body problem, so in R3. And by QI, I will denote the position vector for a particle mass MI. So MI is a mass of the particle, so it's a positive number. And from the mathematical point of view, the problem of motion of the end particles uh, comes down to solving this kind of system. Uh, this is second order system and the right hand side of the system is the gradient of the missionary potential we will define in a moment and here by gamma I will denote the gravitational constant so it's a system of differential equations and the name of the system is the equations of motion so right now I would like to define the configuration space so by excluding any collisions, so two particles cannot be in the same position. So this is the condition that there is no collision in this space. And then we will define the Newton and potential by the following formula. In the previous equation, we saw the gradient of this, uh, gradient of this potential. And then we can written our system in a brief form like this. This is the gradient of the Newtonian potential, but we are in the inner space, so we can think like a normal derivative. It's a regular ordinary derivative. And M here is the metric mass. Yeah, so every particle has its mass. And since the general solution of the energy problem cannot be given, from the very beginning, the great importance has been attached to uh, looking for, for some special types of solutions. And one of these types is a central configuration. What is this? It's we have a configuration of n particles. We have n particles from Q1 to Qn. There is no collision. And we say that this configuration is central. If there is a special geometric setting for this configuration such that the acceleration vector and the position vector they are proportional with the same constant proportionality lambda lambda here is positive so it means that the acceleration vectors they are directed into the center of mass and also they are proportional to the distance from the center of mass and uh, we can use the Newton's law, gravitational law, and we can we know the formula for the acceleration vector. We use the the derivative. This is the notation for the derivative of the Newtonian potential. 
So the following equation is satisfied for separate configurations. So it means the force acting here on the J particle is proportional to the product of the mass and the position of this particle. And about the proportionality constant, we know the formula for, the, for this proportionality constant. It, it's always the Newtonian potential over 2 times i. i here is the moment of inertia. So we define this uh, with respect to the origin. So for every particle, it's defined like the product of the mass and the product of the distance from the origin squared. Yeah? So this is the notation for the distance from the origin. And taking all of this into account, so the, new, the Newton's gravitational laws and the definition of the central configuration, we can say that the configuration for n particles is central, even only if the following equation is satisfied. When I will set the i is the moment of inertia, and u is the Newtonian potential, and we can think here that we have gradients, but we can think like they are derivatives. And uh, right now, there is um, two special properties for central configurations. So uh, central configurations, they are invariant under commodities, so scaling. So we have a central configuration, and we scale it, and it still be a central configuration. And the second property is that for every central configuration, they are invariant under rotation. So we have them particles, they create a center configuration, we can rotate about the origin, and it will be still a center configuration. So we can use this property and define an action of the group S of D. It looks strange, but it's just the group of all rotations about the origin. And what's the definition of the action? So here is an element of this group, so the rotation, and here we have our configuration, yeah. n particles, and we define the action of this group, like we rotate every particle separately by the same angle. So when we define this, it, we have that our configuration space, it's the omega, is the configuration space, is a sort of invariant. What does it mean? It means that when we take an element from this configuration space, so we have a configuration of particles without any collisions, and then we rotate, we will sti still get configuration without any collisions. Because we rotate every particle by the same angle. So it's just the meaning of being a sort of invariant. And also for our potentials, they are as of the invariant. It means that uh, because uh, we define this action and our configuration, they are invariant of the rotation. So when we rotate, it's still a central configuration. So we can consider the whole orbit. What does it mean? We just have central configuration, so n particles and then we rotate by, by all angles. For instance, if we are on the plane, we have several bodies, we rotate, we'll get a circle. Yeah? So we call this, uh, when we apply the action of this group, we will call this, this term like orbit. So it means for these potentials, the Newtonian and the moment of inertia, that they are a sort of invariant, it just means that the values are the same for orbit. So for every element from the orbit, the value of these potentials are the same. So instead of, when I substitute instead of this configuration Q, I will choose any other configuration, the rotated one, I will get the same value here. Why? Because this potential does not depend on positions, depends only on the distances between every two particles. But if you, you rotate every particle by the same angle, the distance will not change. So the value will be the same. Here is the same for the moment of inertia, because here is also the distance 
by the distance from the origin. So if you rotate the particle, the distance from the origin will not change. And they are of class C infinity, so it means you can compute every derivative, and every derivative will be continuous. So this looks strange, but it's just what I said, that right now we can consider this problem like and think instead of singular center configurations, we can think about orbits, a whole orbit of center configurations and um, this potential defined by this formula will give us when you compute the derivative and compare with zero, this one gives us the equation for center configuration. And uh, just to remind, we know that we know the formula for lambda or the proportionality constant. And right now I would like to present the one reason why our study of central configurations is important. So let's move to our equation for central configuration but from different angle. So we suppose we are considering a planar body problem, so D is equal to everything is going on on the plane. And we are looking for solutions of very special type, this type. Uh, what kind of type of solution is this? Uh, we have initial positions for initial configuration for the end particles, and then we start rotate them. And omega here is just the angular velocity of the rotation. And right now we can ask questions about the velocity and the initial configuration u, such that this, this will be a solution of our body problem. So we just substitute to our equation of motion, and we will get this strange equation. But here the problem is simpler, because the, our initial configuration is a constant function. So when you compute the derivatives, they will be zero. So we will get rid of these parts yeah, when we have derivatives and we will get just this equation. And that was our equation for central configuration. So mm. with this proportionality constant. So it just means that when we prove the existence of new central configuration, we will get a new solution of the end of the problem. And this the, the, the solution, they are called relative equilibria. And uh, to see this on the pictures, uh, we can say that the first known are relative equilibria or central configurations uh, were given by Euler in 1767. And they are three classes of collinear central configurations. We have three classes because one class is for one possible ordering of particles on a straight line. Every particle, they are aligned on straight lines. And we can, but we can identify two classes. If you can get from the one to the other, by rotation about the 180 degrees. So on the left hand side animation, we have an example of relative equilibrium. And uh, this random equilibrium comes from the configuration of Euler. So you can, you can see that at any time, if you stop the animation, I don't know how to stop. Uh, if you stop the animation, the shape created by the particles is the same. It's always straight line. So this means the shape created, the configuration, so they are like on the straight line. They are central configuration and we start to rotate this configuration and this will be a solution for the three-body problem. And the second known uh, central configurations were given by Lagrange in 1772. And they are three particles uh, located at the vertices of the um, equilateral triangle. And this is an example of relative equilibrium. Uh, which comes from the central configuration of Lagrange. So we have three particles, and they are located at the vertices. And here is the same. We start with central configuration, we start to rotate about the origin, so with some velocity, 
And if the velocity, angular velocity of rotation is correct, it will give us the solution, a solution for the three-body problem. And later it was proved that this six, three plus two, six, uh, five, I'm sorry, five uh, solutions, they are also possible solutions, possible relative equilibria for the three-body problem. So we, we have only this kind of central configurations in the three-body problems, they are all. And the solutions from the previous slide, they are a part of a very important class of solutions. Uh, they are called homographic solutions. And we have two important classes of these solutions. The first one, as we said, they are relative equilibria. So when we have configurations and then we rotate, is the first class. And the second class is an example is here. We have a configuration and we scale them. So uh, it's the, from the previous slide, they were periodic solutions. But this, for example, these solution is no longer periodic. Here, just the particles, they reach collision at the center of mass. And this one, this, I'm oh, sorry, this solution is the most general type of homographic solutions. So we have both. We have rotation yeah, about the origin, and we have scaling together. And all of these solutions they come from they come from central configurations. That was the that's the reason because studying of central configurations is so important because homographic solutions are the only explicit solutions we have for a body problem. So that was the motivation. And what I would like to talk today it's about bifurcation. I will give definitions later. But right now I can say that to consider or to study bifurcations, we have to have known families. So we have to have given a family of central configuration and we will study something going on close this family. So right now we can assume that we have two continuous maps. The first one, we choose a path in the configuration space. So we fix positions. And then we have another path is in the masses. So we have our masses are also fixed. And here it depends on the parameter. Here rho will be the parameter. So this is the equation for the central configuration. Uh, this equation uh, is satisfied for this family. So we define the family of central configurations. Uh, in the examples, I will give you exact families. Uh, but here this family is parameterized, and the row here is a parameter. And right now, we define new potential, because it's too difficult to uh, study both masses and positions. So we just fix the masses. So we will give the masses, the masses will be fixed on every level of the parameter, the masses will be fixed. And we take the proportionality constant from the known family, and we only will be looking for new positions to get new families, new central configurations. So only position, the masses and the proportionality constant, they are fixed. And this is just the notation for our family we defined here at the top, and we'll consider this equation, so we will uh, look for new positions with fixed masses and fixed proportionality constant. And right now I would like to go to some abstract results, and I prepared, you can consider this problem in more general ways. So instead of all groups of rotations about the origin, you can consider every compact group, but I think I would like to stick today to applications. So only consider the group of all rotations about the origin. So I will skip the general. I just put this to have uh, formal notation and so on. But I will skip the general context. I am going to 
definition of local bifurcation. What does it mean? So we have our space Rn and we have our space of parameters. This is our space of parameters and we have our trivial family F. So it's a family of non-central configurations. And we know positions and masses. And the family is like this, that for every level of the parameter, we have one orbit, so one rotated central configuration. Yeah? And right now, we choose two levels in the space of parameters. So we choose row one, uh, row minus and row plus, two levels, and we say that a uh, local bifurcation of non-trivial central configurations appears from this part of the family, so between levels of minus and zero plus. So not trivial, what is the non-trivial solutions? The family F is called trivial. So the other solutions, we will call them non-trivial solutions. And we say that the local bifurcation occurs between these levels from minus and zero plus if we can find a level, for instance, row zero, between row minus and row plus, such that this orbit at the level row zero is an accumulation orbit. So it means we can think about orbits, but we can think about points. So here is uh, our central trivial central configuration at the level row zero. And we can say that from this level, bifurcation occurs, if we have a sequence of non sequence of non-trivial central configurations approaching this level. And then we can say that the parameter is a parameter of local bifurcation and the orbit is just an orbit of local bifurcation and by this symbol we will denote the set of all parameters of local bifurcation. And right now I would like to define the second type of bifurcation, it's global one. So we have exactly the same situation like before. And here I would like to define the bifurcation also from the level row zero. And the difference is like this. Uh, for local bifurcation we have a sequence. And here I try to match that it's a sequence, it's a dashed line. And for global bifurcation, we need not only a sequence, but a connected set. This is the notation for the red part, C O rho zero. So we need to have a connected set of non-trivial central configurations, touch the trivial family at the level rho zero, but all also this red part must satisfy uh, one alternative. So the condition is the following. Uh, this set must be non-compact, so we can think it's unbounded or touching the boundary, or we have to find another level, for instance, row one, different from row zero, such that this red part will touch the trivial family at different at this level. So it's the definition for the global application and uh, it's analogically the same, the terminology. Parameter is a parameter of global application and the orbit is an orbit of global application and here is the notation for the set of all parameters of global application. Okay, this is the technical part. And this is the first theorem. This theorem, uh, it's known in the literature. So this, is, uh, this theorem gives us the necessary condition for uh, the existence of local bifurcation. So it means uh, we can prove that this net quality is always true. This one uh, is the, just the second derivative of our notation. This is the notation for the second derivative. So we are in the Euclidean space, so we can think about this like a matrix. And this is the dimension of the kernel is always greater or equal than the dimension of the orbit. So when we com come back to our uh, central configuration of on plane, 
for instance, the six gone from my slide before, and we rotate it, it will be an orbit, and in this case it will be a circle. So the dim dimension of the circle is equal to one. So for this special central configuration, uh, six gone, for this six gone, here will be one. So the dimension of the kernel of our second derivative is always greater or equal than one in this special case. And for the necessary condition, we have that if um, an orbit is an orbit of local application, it must be the, the strict inequality as B2. So this is the, and then we will call the orbit non-degenerate. Yeah? In this case, and in this case, degenerate. And this theorem was, can be proved using this article, the in this function theorem, but with symmetries. We know in this function theorem, but this one is with symmetries. And this theorem was proved by Dancer in 1980. So this was necessary condition, and right now the sufficient condition. No? So this is the, by this symbol, I will denote the Morse index of a symmetric matrix. It's just the number of negative eigenvalues for this matrix. Yes, so we, we summing up all negative eigenvalues and we call it the Morse index. And this is the formal statement of the theorem, the formal assumptions, but I would like to explain the theorem uh, using a picture. So, this is our trivial family of central configurations. We have parameter space, and we chose two levels in the parameter space, uh, rho minus and rho plus. And on every level, we have one orbit of central configurations, for which we know the positions, the masses, we know everything about these central configurations. And here, uh, this is the second derivative of our potential and can be expressed in this way. So we have two matrices, <coughs> sorry, uh, B and C, and here the zeros are the kernel of this matrix. And it's always the, the formula for the second derivative in this case is always like this. And what's about our assumptions for our theorem? So we chose these orbits, they are non-degenerate. What does it mean? It means that these two matrices, they are non-singular. So the determinants are different from zero. And we would like to have special orbits. What does it mean special? It means we would like to have this uh, Morse index for this matrix C being zero. So non, uh, no negative eigenvalues for these matrices. And in the application, it's a lot of families uh, which satisfy these conditions. And uh, the last condition is that I, we can compute the Morse indexes at these two levels for the matrix B, and they must be different. And it's enough to uh, prove the existence of a local bifurcation between levels rho minus and rho plus. So it means very close, even in very small neighborhood of this level, rho zero, we can find new central configurations, which are different type than those trivial ones. And this is the first, the first theorem, giving sufficient conditions for local bifurcations. And the second one is very similar, and I also have a picture. We have exactly the same situation, so we chose two levels, we have two orbits of our trivial central configurations, they are non-degenerate, so the matrices here, P and C, they are non-singular. For the matrix C, there is no negative eigenvalues, so it means these two orbit, orbits are special. And uh, for local application, we have this condition. And right now, if we change the condition a little bit, so
So we want that these two Morse indexes, they are of different parity. Even and not, or than even. So then it's enough to get the existence of global application. So the red one, when we have not only a sequence of new central configuration, but a connected set of central configurations. And that's all from the main part, the abstract part. I have some examples from when I when we will see the exact families. And just to remind, we would like to apply those three theorems. So the right and the most input part right now is just to compute the second derivative and express like before the matrix and then compute the Morse indexes. So it's not, not so fast to compute this. And the first family is the family for eight bodies. And this family was studied by Fernandez, Melo de Silva uh, in 2013. And the family looks like this. So we have four masses uh, located at the vertices of a square of side equal one. So the size of the square is fixed. And the other four masses at the vertices of the smaller square, and the size of the square is not fixed. It's parameterized by R. R here is the ratio of the circumcircle of the square. And about the masses. So we assume that the masses on the smaller square, they are equal and equal what? So they are fixed. For the masses of, on the bigger square, they are depend on the parameter R. But the formulas proved by Fernandez, Melo, and Silva, they are too long and too complicated to put in a slide. So I didn't put, but they prove uh, exact formulas for the masses, and they prove that with these assumptions, this family is a family of central configurations. For every parameter R, from this segment, so between 0 and R0. This is the approximate value for R0. And we try to apply those theorems, or abstract theorems, for this family. This, this is our trivial family. R here is the parameter. And we try to compute the Morse indexes and prove something in this case. So we chose three parameters. So this will be the size of the inner square. It's the square root of 2 over 7, and the other 2. And we computed that they are very good orbits, so they are non-degenerate. So we can study these three orbits, and we computed the Morse indexes at these three levels. And for instance, at the level R3, the Morse index of our matrix B is 4. For R2 is 3 and 1. So the Morse indexes, they change. So it means we can prove the existence of new families between these three levels. And for the first two levels, from R2 to R3, the parity of the Morse indexes, they are different. That is 4 and 3. So it means we can prove the existence of global application. But for between levels R1 and R2, they are the same parity, the Morse indexes, so we can prove only the existence of local application. So there is a sequence, converging sequence of new center configuration, converging to our trivial family of two nested squares. And it's possible to prove that what bifurcate from this family is not the type of two nested squares. We have fixed masses, so it's on the only possibility, possibility is that they are less symmetrical. And we can use the implicit function theorem, the normal one, to prove this. And there is also a question, if it's possible for this blue one, being red one, so it's possible for this local bifurcation being uh, 
Global education, we don't know how to prove, and it's probably with other tools, but we know how to answer this question. That was the first argument. And the similar results you can prove for the second family and the second family Rosen's central configuration. This family was given by Sekiguchi in 2004 and we have the problem of 13 bodies. So we have six bodies located at the vertices of this six gone and another six bodies located at the vertices of another six gone. The second six gone is rotated and here is about 30 degrees. And the size of these two is fixed. Yeah? They are fixed, it's R1 and R2. And uh, the last body is here in the center of mass. And Sekiguchi proved that doesn't matter for any masses, M0 and M1. Uh, M0 is the mass of the particle in the center, and M1, they are masses uh, um, located at the vertices of the inner uh, system. And for any masses M0 and M1, this family is a family of separate configurations if the mass M2 is defined like this. The formula here is not complicated, so it's okay to put in the slide. So right now we have uh, our parameter spaces to a dimensional. We have two parameters, M0 and M1. And we can uh, compute exactly the same. Here, this is the parameter space, M1, no, sorry, M0 and M1. And we have a couple of open sets, so um, just for short. For the open set M3, it means for, for parameters from this set, the Morse index is equal to 3. For uh, M5, for this set, for the parameters, the Morse index is equal to 5. So it means there exists some global and global applications. So if you pass it through, passing through the blue lines, the Morse indexes, they change but the parity is not changing, so we can prove that from these blue lines we have a lot of application, yeah? For parameter from these blue lines. And only from that red line, the parity is changing, so we have the existence of global application. And the same, the same like before, what part create from those lines is less symmetrical. It's not the Rosette family. It's different type of symmetry. And the last example is in the, for the spatial and body problem. Here we have family um, which uh, was proved uh, by Corbella Libre in 2008. So we have two nested regular cubes. The size of the first one is fixed. Yeah? The side of the cube is equal to 1, so we have fixed positions, and the second cube will be scaled. And the row here is a scaling factor. And about the masses, the masses on the fixed cube, they are fixed and equal 1, and the masses on the scale, they depend on the parameter. And also the same situation formula for are too long to put in the slide. And Corbera and Brad, they proved that this family is family of simple configurations. And for every scaling factor, they're all breaking the, this number out. And we can prove exactly the same. We chose three levels, so three sizes for the scale of cube. We proved that all these are non-degenerate. We computed the Morse indexes, the Morse indexes they change, so it means there is a global bifurcation between levels row 2 and row 3 and local one between these levels row 1 and row 2 because the parity is the same. And the same, uh, we, we got the bifurcation of something which is less symmetrical. 
but using these techniques it's impossible to find the shape. We only uh, prove the existence, not the shapes. The same question, if this blue one can be red one, of course we don't know. And that's all, I think. And this, the last slide um, involves all families. They were checked and it's possible to prove the same results for these families, so bifurcations. And you, as you can see, they are very, very symmetrical. What's the reason? Because the finding new families is a very difficult problem. So the idea is that you fix something, you put some constraints, like for instance for the masses, you assume the masses are equal, and the size of the first square is fixed, and then the equations for a motion is simplified, and then you can prove the existence of something. And I think that's all. Thank you. Ah, 
I know, that's the, uh, to be honest, <laughs> it's like this. For the plumber ones, uh, they are real relative equilibria. So they are real solutions. But for the special ones, it's obvious that there is no motion solution like this. So only I created one possible move. But if the bodies rotate like this, they will collapse. Mm -hmm. yeah. So there is no solutions like this for new rotation in the plane because they will collapse. There is a very more complicated movement, but it was too complicated for me to create these kind of animations. Because the first one came from Moke. Mm -hmm. Yes, 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 that, uh, yes, that's true. Probably it's uh, not the tree of this year. Gracias. 